Welcome to Critical Role Demystified. I'm Mike Christensen, and this is the series where we break down the lessons we can learn as DMs and as players from episodes of Critical Role. Today we're tackling episode 30, Stoke the Flames. As a reminder, if you want an extended version of this video with additional Critical Role clips that don't serve the story or offer a lesson, but that I just think are fun moments that are worth experiencing, those are in the Patreon-only version of this video, which is available to people who support me at $5 a month or more. Specifically, the Patreon version of this episode has more content about the cast's Halloween costume shenanigans, because this episode is their Halloween special, and man oh man, these nerds go all out for Halloween every single year. If you want to hear me talk about their costumes and see how being in a costume has put them in a very bizarre mood for most of the game, check out this video on Patreon. In the announcements at the beginning of the episode, we learn that Orion is no longer with the show, but they wish him all the best. As the episode begins, the characters return to their tavern hideout and move down to the roots of the sun tree, and cast hallucinatory terrain over the entrance to their tunnel to keep them hidden. And now that they have a private moment, it's time to talk about Percy's condition. Of apparently being full of black smoke or something? Hey Percy, what's up with that? A few years ago, I had a dream. I had a very intense dream. And in this dream, something asked me if, if I wanted revenge, and if I wanted the means to have revenge. And all I would have to do in return is offer up the souls of those I took. Oh, that's all? Wait, what? It was a dream. Yeah, it was a dream. I've had, it was not, it was, it was just a dream, and... And yet you're, you've, you've fashioned your entire life's goal upon this dream. Percy never believed the dream was real. Sure, after he woke up, he had the idea for the gun, but he didn't think that meant he was genuinely inspired by some otherworldly entity. And as a note, Taliesin didn't know either. He's been on the record that he gave Matt the backstory we've heard from Percy. The Briarwoods killed his family, he barely escaped, he had a dream and invented the gun, but he told Matt he was fine with the dream just being a dream, or being something more. And that decision was ultimately up to Matt. Taliesin also had no idea Silas would be a vampire or Delilah would be a magic user and didn't know what actually brought them to Whitestone. All of those other details were added by Matt. We're going to make some videos later this year that specifically tackle this approach to campaign design, but this is what Matt does for his games. He takes the backstories of his players, sifts through them for relevant lore and NPCs and locations, adds details the players wouldn't have had access to, and then waits to introduce these story beats until the most dramatic moment for them to become relevant to the story. That's not his only approach. In Campaign 2, he tends to sit on those elements until the party asks about them, rather than dropping them on the players in dramatic ways, because Campaign 2 is mostly a player-directed sandbox adventure. But for Campaign 1, the linear story he's presenting is often fueled by the details they gave him at the beginning of the campaign. Of course, that's mainly true starting with the Briarwood arc. For the first half of the campaign, most of which we never saw, that wasn't how he did things at all. The party had met Vex and Vax's father, they'd fought Grog's undead father, they'd found one relic Tiberius was searching for, and right before the Craghammer arc, they'd crossed paths with a few Goliaths from Grog's former herd, but that was the extent to which their backstories played a major role. To my knowledge, that's four brief references across eight levels of gameplay, playing once a month for two years. Even Keyleth's visit to another Ashari tribe was handled as downtime between sessions right before they started streaming their games. Before that, the party just went from quest to quest in a fairly typical fashion. We can see some of this in the Dark Horse comics that recap the events of the pre-stream game, and I'll make a video about those at some other point. But now we're at the point in the campaign where Matt is very deliberately mining their backstories as inspiration for many of the plot points the party will encounter across the rest of the campaign. Anyway, let's dive back into the conversation with Percy. He had no idea the black smoke was real. And once again, they ask who the last barrel is for. And Percy tells them it's symbolic. He'd always known he'd have to kill more than just the five people that he saved bullets for. He's not Captain Jack Sparrow refusing to fire a gun until he can actually kill Barbosa, the man who has earned his vengeance. The sixth barrel represents everyone whose names didn't go onto the gun, but still wind up in his crosshairs. It represents that vengeance doesn't just hurt the people you swear it on, it hurts lots of other people. But all of that was the compromise Percy was willing to make in order to get vengeance. Those other lives, whether or not he knew their souls would be sacrificed, those lives are a price he was willing to pay to get what he wanted. He even admits that he's glad there's justice to be found in his actions, 
But he's not looking for justice. He's looking for vengeance. And if this voice, this black smoke, is indeed real, then he hopes that the souls of the people he's hunting will suffer in anguish. Scanlan makes an insight roll on Percy, and the way Matt handles this is perfect for this moment. 18. 18? Go and roll a dice, Percy. Uh, dice plus what? Actually, I'll roll it for you. What's your bonus? Uh, for which? Uh, for both <coughs> persuasion and deception. Persuasion and deception? Uh, persuasion six, deception two. Cool, gotcha. Okay. Uh, he seems very earnest, very broken, confused but driven, and there isn't any part of his voice that seems to conceal or attempt to hold back any information. Now, this isn't perfect for every group or every situation, but there are some circumstances where I think there's a benefit to rolling on behalf of a party member. This is a really interesting example because Matt knows what we know now. From every interview we've heard in the past eight years, we know Talison and Percy had the same amount of information. In this scene, Percy is being honest, but by hiding that role, Matt is removing the opportunity for metagaming and forcing the players to engage with the situation based purely on what their characters would know. He's basically saying, I'm not going to let you use the dice as an excuse to let Percy off the hook or remain suspicious because he rolled higher than you. I'll just tell you what you know, and you won't know whether you succeeded or failed. And you have to move forward with just the information and not the meta information of how high or low the die roll was. It's something I think about doing sometimes when my party makes rolls where their characters wouldn't know if they succeeded or not, like stealth checks, insight checks, and perception checks. I don't have a lot of reason to do it in most of my current games, since my groups don't really have that metagaming problem, but I'm going to start playing games with strangers soon, so I'll probably add this technique back into my repertoire. And this is the kind of thing I'd bring up in a session zero. Some players love this, some players don't. That's okay. Like I said, it's not right for all circumstances. Matt himself will feel out the situation and sometimes let his players know the roles, or Sometimes he won't ask for roles, or sometimes he'll hide the roles. And there's also a huge difference in the playstyle you're encouraging by hiding insight check roles from your players versus hiding stealth or perception check roles from your players. And that's to say nothing of whether players have special re-roll abilities that they'd really like to use for important checks. So that's why this is a session zero conversation, or at least something to discuss before deploying it in a game. If this is a technique that you're interested in using, talk to your players and see if they're comfortable with it. Anyway, the party discusses what they're going to do next, and we dip into a repeat of the argument from last time. Vax points out that the people of this town will be just as scared of them as they are of the Briarwoods if Fox Machina acts just as brutal as their current oppressors. Scanlan counters that they knew they were there for an assassination, and this approach of shock and awe is how they'll get results. We have two differing opinions, and of course, Grog is on Team Kill Everybody Brutally. Vex, Keyleth, and Percy agree that it did get too dark, and Percy asks the team to keep him in line and keep him honest. If he goes dark, darker than usual, if he actually threatens one of them or goes after people who don't deserve it, he asks them to knock him out and take him to a temple. It's also worth noting that they aren't objecting to how dark the scene got. This isn't a discussion of lines and veils. They're objecting to their own actions, and they're doing so in character. But that's something to watch for in your own games. This discussion might not be about just what they're doing. It might actually be about how it's being depicted. It's not an issue for the cast of Critical Role, but some groups might take this opportunity to decide to turn down the dial of descriptions of violence, and not necessarily the actions themselves. That's the goal of safety tools, not just to set up rules at the beginning of the campaign, but also to make sure everyone has a shared language to communicate as the game goes on. The group goes to sleep, but in the middle of the night, it gets a lot colder, and the tunnel fills with mist, which then coalesces into a few physical beings. And now they're in a confined space with three vampires. Lovely. Although technically, I think they're only vampire spawn. They're much weaker than someone like Silas. Although I'm certain Matt would have monkeyed with their stats more than a little bit to make sure they are a threat to 6th, 11th, or 12th level adventurers. And it's initiative, so here are some highlights. The players roll a lot of ones. And they're also fully losing their minds because of their costumes. So there's a really fun manic energy in this scene. <laughs> All right, uh, Vax, you're up. No, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna hold for a turn. <laughs> Are you really? All right. Va no. Va Vax is not going after Grog. Yep. Scanlan wakes up and pees, and also fires a bunch of shots from his wand of magic missiles. The imagery is lost on no one. 
Grog and Percy get bit by vampires, but besides that, the party does pretty well. Keyleth reaches around Scanlan and casts Sunbeam, and immediately vaporizes two vampires. And Scanlan finishes off the last one with vicious mockery, shouting at it and thrusting. So Matt narrates that the creature isn't killed by the magic of the mockery, but that the urine droplets could be interpreted as running water, something vampires are weak to. And then, maybe because he didn't also want this vampire to be slain by urine, Matt describes the vampire shrinking away in fear, and then Matt declares that Grog smashed it with a hammer. That's two or three levels of hand-waving to deal with something a lot of tables struggle with. How the heck does mocking someone kill them? Bards are weird. The party debates whether to find a new place to sleep for the rest of the night, which would involve going out at midnight into a town run by vampires, or just stick it out in the tunnel for the rest of the night and hope the vampires who found them hadn't had a chance to relay any messages back to their companions, and that they aren't literally spawning from the cursed roots of the sun tree. They split the difference and move up to the cellar and block off the tunnel to the roots. As they wake, they all make another wisdom saving throw. The DC is only 11, but Percy fails again and takes another point of corruption. Last time he got a bit of a cough. What's the effect now? These sadistic tendencies that you've been exerting through a lot of this event are becoming harder and harder to control. Be mindful that when you strike to kill, you strike to torture before you do. Well, the fact that he gained that effect right after the conversation they had at the top of the episode is objectively very funny. As a note, Matt eventually published these corruption rules on the DM's Guild, the link is in the description below. They recast Seeming, and Scanlan and Vax go to talk to the townsfolk and get a lay of the land, while the rest go to find a new hideout. The hideout team goes to the Alcove, a magic shop that Percy frequented as a child. They learn from the clerk at the desk that the proprietor, Simon Whisk, was called away for a project by the Briarwoods. He's been living in the castle for six months. Except he hasn't been back to visit in more than a month. Even Money says he's still in the castle, just not living anymore. The clerk is Jordana, Simon's daughter. They try to suss out if she can be trusted to keep them safe if they stay there for the night, but meanwhile, she's trying to determine if they can be trusted. It would be great if Percy could establish who he is, if only he wasn't under a seeming spell. I can't drop the seeming. Can no, I? you're stuck. Just drop that fat name of yours, buddy. It's true. Grog only says. one person would know the entire <laughs> name. <laughs> 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 <Rolo. laughs> Yeah, it's Musseldorf, Musketeers. Percival Sanchez Vicario. <laughs> I'm Almond so excited. Percival, Percival von, the Nina, the Pinta, von the Musel, Santa Maria. Percival von Musel, Gronola, uh, von Lichtenstein, <laughs> Kevin Dorf, Rolo III. Kevin Brau Dorf, Buka. Wesley Snipes. I love you all Magneto so much. Magneto, Rolo III. De, de, Rolo III. Chakoidi, say just. This moment of tension uh, with, <laughs> with Jordana. Up, up, Awkwardly down, staring down. at these all very <laughs> right. intently looking dirty peasants <laughs> with a donkey, names. just talking about names. Simon like Whisk was a good friend to Percival Frederick Stein Kowalski and von Nieskudorola the Third. You can call him Percy. Percival lives, and he is coming. In the party's defense, even Taliesin reverses two of the names when he says them here in that scene. And honestly, every time he says his name during the entire campaign, Kowalski always sounds like Kowalski. The whole name is hard. At this point, the stream lost audio for a moment, but when it came back, it seems Percy was able to convince Jordana to trust them. They're discussing when they're going to be back to spend the night, and she's handing them a few healing potions and another immovable rod. Although the players think that their old immovable rod might have gone with Tiberius. I wonder if Matt did this on purpose. Like, he really wanted them to have an immovable rod? Or was it just a coincidence? Did he forget they had one? Does he just love that magic item? Also, I know at some point they'll wind up with two immovable rods, so either they'll realize Tiberius didn't take it after all, or maybe they'll retcon that he left it behind, or they'll find another. Man, I don't know if I've ever had an immovable rod in my games, but Matt has added at least two, maybe three in this campaign alone. I just think it's funny that different DMs have different magic items they consider iconic or essential to the D&D experience. Anyway, we cut to Vax and Scanlan who find a tavern and start talking to the patrons. They meet a man named Patrick who has been trying to find a way out of town for months, but someone is always watching. As a note, um, serious subject now, please skip to the timecode below to avoid a reference to suicide. Adding to the despair in Whitestone, Patrick tells our heroes that even if someone in town takes the easy way out, they just become another undead in the service of the Briarwoods. So everyone either has to try to survive in this hell, or they'll get added to the horde. I have a friend named Kevin. He says, he says there is someone trying to do something about it. 
and he says he says that that's what caused that fire yesterday over at that that big fancy house. He yeah, says there's that. there's rebels afoot. Patrick says he hopes these new champions are better prepared than the last ones. It seems there was a failed uprising three years ago. But if the new uprising does happen, a lot of Whitestone citizens would join the fight. Better to go out in a blaze of glory than live under this tyranny. The whole party meets back up at the Ladies' Chamber, the Temple of Arathis, and they hear a bit of Keeper Yenin's sermon, about how one of their oppressors was killed, his advisor maimed, and the house burned, and how hope is returning to Whitestone. After the sermon, Vox Machina speaks with Yenin, and we learn that there is an informant inside Whitestone Castle. And from this informant, Yenin knows that the Briarwoods are rebuilding or repurposing something old and terrible beneath the city, something they know only as the Ziggurat. Yenin also refers to the lore of Paylor planting the sun tree and the implication that he might have done so to heal a wound. That's something that might play a larger role as Critical Role continues. We'll see. And then their informant from the castle arrives. Archibald Desne, a long-respected philosopher and a former chancellor to Percy's father. Again, in the cartoon he was a rough-and-tumble dwarf, but here he's an old, old man. They drop the illusion on Percy and reveal his true nature, and we get a lovely reunion between Percy and Archie. And then Archie drops a huge bomb. With you here, Percival, we've two Dorolo spearheading a rebellion. We have the guiding light the people need. Who, who, who else survived? We must succeed, Percival. If this fails, there won't be anyone else left to rise up. They're nearing their goal, according to your sister, Cassandra. We haven't much time. Your sister leaves Percival. Oh, shit! She survived the attack and was taken as the personal assistant or slave of the Briarwoods and used as an example, a symbol of their dominance. She's been feeding us information for years, whenever she could, and she was the helping guide the last two attempts we've made. We've not received a letter for her in weeks now, but no, you're not the only surviving member of your family. I will talk to your people. I will talk to mine. We'll have your militia. Guide us, Percival Frederick Stein von Musel Kowalski de Rolo III. Wow! Wow! Us. Ox Machina. That's fucking up. Wait, Ox Machina. You know who we are? Oh, how does he know? I don't know. I just want to keep playing these clips. This episode is so good. This show is so good. They learn which enemies live in the two remaining noble houses. The party assumed Dr. Ripley lived in one of them, but Archie says that she did, but she's packed recently. She's gone. No one knows where she is. Professor Anders lives in the castle, so that means that the four remaining names on Percy's list are either in the castle or unaccounted for, which is a fun way to prolong Percy's quest for revenge. The two other new nobles remaining in the manor houses are Duke Vedmire and Count Tyleri, but both of these men are mercenaries who were part of the original insurrection. Tyleri has the worst reputation. He's a sadistic man who beats and tortures his servants. Killing him would be the biggest signal to rally the most people to the rebellion, to inspire the most hope. Matt reminds them that they heard the name Tyleri from Desmond, the coachman they interrogated back in Amon. But he doesn't remind them of the most important detail Desmond told them, and they don't check their notes or didn't write it down, and I'm not going to reveal it here, so we'll deal with that detail when they encounter Tyleri in the next episode. Fox Machina needs a plan. The longer they take to build support in the city, the more time the villains have to prepare. Percy suggests that they create a diversion at Duke of Edmire's estate, maybe starting another fire, to draw the attention of the city. And while their enemies rush to protect the Duke, the party attacks Tyleri. They do not plan to attack the Briarwood Castle tonight. That can wait until tomorrow. Scanlan volunteers to be the person to cause the distraction, so most of the rest of them can focus on Tyleri's house and be in position to strike as quickly as possible. They split the party and sneak through the rainy city to reach their target houses. Scanlan becomes a dragonfly and waits on the doorframe to the Duke's house, right above one of the guards. Once the other team is in place, they call him on their earrings, and he says they should wait 30 seconds and then strike that house. Really, they should give it like 5 or 10 minutes so the city actually has a chance to react, but, you know... The best laid plans. I turn into a triceratops. <laughs> <laughs> and out of nowhere, 
this tiny fly swoosh into a triceratops. <laughs> Boom! Lands and crushing the man beneath you. Um, and for my move, I bash down the door. The loud cracking sound, the whole uh, outside of the of the the, the doorway and, and most of that side of the room is just thrashed and destroyed. Wood chunks go flying everywhere with a loud roar. You see the uh, last part of the inside of the foyer collapses from that side of the building. You basically just take out a whole support um, and start thrashing around. <laughs> you hear voices begin yelling out from in the household, and uh, immediately uh, five guards start rushing in from different rooms towards you. <laughs> it begins. At the other house, Grog and Trinket rush the door, Percy and Keyleth head towards the back, and the twins go for a side window. And that's the end of the episode. We'll deal with both of these home invasions next time. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be back in two weeks to discuss episode 31, Gunpowder Plot. As a note, the video on demand on YouTube had to be split into two videos, but it's still one episode, so we'll still discuss it all in the same video. Now, should you watch episode 31? Well, look, we're at the point where I'm pretty much going to recommend you watch every episode of Critical Role if we talk about it, if you're interested. Because they're all going to be pretty good from here on out. There's like one episode I find boring in the entire remaining 100 episodes of Vox Machina. But episode 31 is especially good because of what Scanlan gets up to in that house. It's an absolute joy to watch. One of the best scenes in the campaign. We're going to have a lot to say about it. I also want to thank the folks who sent me birthday gifts off of my Amazon wish list. Thank you so much to all of you. Um, I got a copy of Kith and Kin, the new Vox Machina novel. Uh, this was sent by Laura. Thank you so much, Laura. I got a copy of the Game Master's Book of Legendary Dragons. This was sent by Olivia Kenny. Uh, thank you so much. I feel like we're going to talk a lot more about dragons on this channel later this year, so this is going to be a great resource for that. I got a copy of the Cobalt Press book Deep Magic. Uh, thank you so much to... Uh, Wouter Bogarts. Um, you know, we're gonna talk a little bit more about um, magic items later this year, too. I think this book's gonna be a fun resource for that conversation as well. And I also got this copy of the Pathfinder Beginner's Box, but Amazon screwed up. I didn't know this was from Amazon until I looked on the website to see what gifts had come from the wish list, but there was no slip inside. I actually don't know who sent this. So if this was sent by you, uh, please let me know. I actually thought this was from Paizo until I looked on Amazon. Uh, if you sent this to me for my birthday, please let me know in the comments below so I can thank you properly. I also got some gifts off my throne wish list. Those haven't arrived in person when I'm recording this in April, but I got the Kingdoms of Warfare book, DM screen, and special unit deck, uh, Odyssey of the Dragon Lords from Mophius Entertainment, and some partial contributions towards a new desk setup, which is going to be a huge help. My current desk that I work at is coming apart at the seams. So anyway, if you'd like to support the channel financially, but Patreon isn't your thing, Check out those wish lists. See if there's anything there that strikes your fancy. If you can't support me financially, I completely understand. There are other ways you can help support the channel as well. The easiest is just to subscribe and ring the bell. That way you'll get notified when I release new videos every Monday and Thursday, including a video on Monday about dinosaurs in D&D, a sequel of sorts to this video. I'd also love for you to come and be a part of our Discord community. Those folks are absolutely incredible. And if you want news about my latest updates, uh, sign up for my newsletter. I also live stream on Twitch at least once a week, uh, so follow me there for some fun stuff. Sometimes I record future videos on Twitch, like this video, about creating a character starting with their subclass. Check that one out. Uh, it's a great video. Until next time, play fair and have fun.